gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and today I'm going to be reviewing Field Commander Alexander, a solitaire war game from Danverson Games. In Field Commander Alexander, you are going to be able to either play scenarios from or mimic the entire career of Alexander the Great. What I'm showing you here is the setup for the first stage in the campaign, Granicus. But there are also boards for Issus, the Siege of Tyre, which is actually very interesting, and of course, the pinnacle of Alexander's military career, Gagamela. Although not all scenarios will work the exact same way, they do follow a common pattern that I'm going to use the Granica setup to show you. The first thing that's really convenient about this game is that because you have four different scenarios that all link together, there's actually campaign setup information for your specific scenario on each of the boards. So this is going to tell you what kind of units you want to have for yourself and what kind of units you, the enemies will have in what locations. So I did this entire setup just by looking at the board. You'll also be given a victory condition on the board. So this one says the campaign ends and you score victory points when you've conquered all pivotal areas and Alexander's army is in Lycia. So we know where we have to go. In the case of the Granica scenario, Alexander's army starts here. You're gonna come down here to Chironea and then you'll go back up around down to Lycia, taking out all these Persian forces as you go. You'll also be given campaign options, so if you want to play a more difficult campaign, there are little options to make the game harder for you, and you can mix and match as you please. There's an enemy operations box, which we'll actually talk about more in a moment, and then there's also the sequence of play, which will actually walk you through your entire turn step by step. So there are lots of things to do in the game, but there actually isn't a lot that you have to remember because it's laid out for you very conveniently. There are even specific details for the resupply up here and for enemy orders in the middle of the board so that each scenario can have its own flavor and style, but also so that you don't have to go flipping through the rulebook for every last thing. One thing the game however does push you to do is to finish your campaign quickly. There are victory points listed in the top right corner of each of these spaces in the turn track, and you get the highest number of victory points for winning by spring of 335 BC, so that's 25 points. If you take all the way to the winter of 334 BC, you'll actually get negative 10 points. The other way to gain victory points is to build cities, which you have an opportunity to do in every area on the map you pass through. The cost of the city is variable, but you can always find your prices right up here by your treasury. So just to give you a sense of how the game works, I'm going to talk you very quickly through what a turn would look like, and I think that'll serve as a good overview. So to do your turn, you just go to sequence of play. You have preparation, so you would advance your turn counter every turn. You can refit. What that means is that you basically pay two gold to fix up each of the injured units that you would like to. So we'll look at this a little more closely in a moment, but when your units get hit in battle, you flip them over to a less valuable side before they die, unless they're archers, in which case they just die. But you can refit your units per turn to bring them back up into shape. Next, you're going to have enemy orders. And what that means is that you're basically going to roll a die for each stronghold on the map. Then you take the number that you rolled, you count Alexander's spaces away from that stronghold. So here's Alexander's army right here. And based on that value, you're going to determine what it is the enemy is going to do. So the enemy might build a wall. The enemy might cause you to lose money or suffer a hit. They might garrison. They might even do nothing. But in each turn, each enemy stronghold is going to carry out some sort of enemy order, and that's how you determine it. After that, you do enemy operations. Basically what that means is that you turn over one of these operations counters down here. So we start with one force already here, because that's the instructions for the Granicus campaign. But operations might ask us to do things like add a wall or a force, and you will basically have to keep adding threatening things to this enemy operations box, or you have to pay gold to eliminate the threat. Eventually, you'll draw a token that says go, and then if that happens, here it says to deploy all of those forces in Halicarnassus. So basically, your operation throughout the game can end up affecting what happens here in Halicarnassus, because it's gonna be an area it takes you a while to get to. So stuff can really pile up and get out of control down here and cause you to waste time at the end of the scenario. So once you've done your enemy operations, it's your turn. The very most interesting thing about this conquest step of the turn is that you get to repeat this part of your turn as many times as you want. There's definitely a push your luck element to this. So the first thing that you're always gonna do is called a scouting roll. So here's Alexander. Let's say he wants to come to Chironia and kick some butt. So we'd roll, we rolled a two. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna compare your die roll with the number of units in your army. In this case, the die roll is two and there are five units. So that's a difference of three. 
And that would mean that Alexander is going to have to pay three gold to feed his large army as he moves into this next area. If the die had been a six, that would actually mean that Alexander was outnumbered going into this area and he'd have to suffer one hit because that's the difference between six and five. If I just rolled a five, nothing would happen and Alexander could move with no consequences. So there's a bit of a push and pull depending on the size of the army that you're moving as you scout into new areas. After you perform your scouting roll, you can decide that you hate the roll and that you don't want to pay or that you don't want to get hurt and you can choose not to move, but that messes up your tempo. And as you might have noticed, there's a very large victory point incentive for moving fast. So in this case, Alexander would probably decide to pay his three gold and move down into Chironia. Depending on where you're going, you actually have some choices about what to do. This orange symbol right here with the crossed spears indicates that this is a battle spot and you're going to have to fight it out. But strongholds on the map, such as the one here at Sardis, give you some options. You can choose to either battle here or you can attempt to intimidate the area that you're trying to conquer. So while in some situations you have to fight, in others you actually have a choice. Here at Chironea though, we will have to fight. So I'm going to zoom in really quick and just give you the briefest of overviews of battle in this game. So when you have a battle in Field Commander Alexander, you're going to line up your forces and the enemy forces from highest to lowest in terms of their initiative number, which is the number up at the top. So our archers are going to go first at five, then the enemy infantry and our heavy cavalry are going to go at the same time at three. Here, their other infantry and our infantry will go. Here, each army has a phalanx and those will go, and then the leaders will get to take their turns. The number in the bottom right corner will tell you what kind of die roll you're aiming for when you attack. The three on this infantry, for example, means that you need to get a three or less in order for your roll to be a hit. Our heavy cavalry, as well as some other units in the game, will have a superscript. So as you can see, they have four and then a superscript of four. What that means is they hit on a four or less, and on a four or less, they hit twice. So basically what will happen is you will roll to see if you can assign hits. So our archer, for example, we need to get a two or less to hit so we can see if he hits and then assign the damage to someone. So in that case, no, the archer did not hit. Then what will happen is you could actually roll two dice, one for this infantry and then one for our cavalry because they go at the same time. And then you'll determine whether they hit anybody. And you'll do the same all the way down the line. Most units can take two hits, archers cannot. Once they're hit, you flip them over and they're blank, they've died. All the other units in this battle, however, can take two hits before they are gone. So let's say our heavy cavalry got hit, then you flip them over to the other side and their battle stats are basically reduced. So you'll have an even more difficult time rolling the dice you need for them to be effective. Alexander is interesting because while he starts out very weak, he eventually powers up tremendously as a character, but you have a very important choice to make with him. At the, at the start of a battle, Alexander can either attack one of the normal units in the army, or Alexander can attack the leader of the opposing army. If he chooses to attack the leader and wins, then you automatically win the entire battle. However, if he doesn't succeed, he and that other leader will be locked in battle against each other until somebody wins. So in a battle like this one where Alexander is pretty weak and he hasn't powered up yet, you could easily kill him by having him go after the enemy leader too early and then having some bad rolls. The other thing that's particularly exciting about battles is that both you and the enemy get battle plans. As Alexander, you get a limited number and then you can pay gold for more. At the Battle of Chironea, you actually have a great deal because this is Alexander's first battle that he fought while his father's still alive. So you actually get three extra battle plans for free because daddy's still around. The enemies will also get battle plans that you'll line up with their units and they can do extra damage to you that way. So here are a couple of enemy battle plans. The infantry one will basically give a little bonus to the enemy infantry. Confusion will cause you to lose one of your battle plans. So the enemies do some pretty nasty stuff to you, but you're also gonna have some pretty cool plans. Regroup allows you to regain forces after battle. Flank adds to the hits that your cavalry and infantry can score. And envelop is great if you already have a little bit of an advantage because you can inflict hits equal to your force advantage. In other words, if you've got more chits on the board than the enemy, you can do damage to them that is the difference between you and them. And there are several other options for battle plans. During the game, you'll also have access to advisors, some of whom do give you serious advantages. For example, Parminion here is a fantastic advisor to choose early on because he takes away some of the enemy's plans and makes them less tricky against you. But other advisors have other special powers. Once you've conquered an area, then you actually have a choice. You get to either raise the area 
and get a large amount of gold right away. So for this part of the campaign, you get 12 gold per pivotal area that you raise. So I can get 12 gold right away, or I can choose to govern the area instead, and I don't get as much gold right away, but I get five gold per turn for the rest of the game. This is actually a very interesting conundrum, especially if you're playing the longer campaign, because if you're going for glory and immortality points, you wanna govern areas, but your treasury is forever short because there's so many things you need to spend gold on, and it's always very, very tempting to just raise an area and take the money. This is especially true because you're never expecting to take very long in one of these games, because again, the incentive is to finish quickly. After a battle, you get to gain glory, choose to raise or govern, which we talked about, and gain raise gold. What's interesting about this game is that at that point, you don't have to stop. You've gone through an entire conquest round, but you can choose to do another one and do another scouting roll. In fact, you can keep doing that until you decide that it's time to stop. So you can keep paying gold to move. You can keep taking hits to move, depending on what your scouting role is. You can keep getting into battle after battle before deciding that your turn is over. But if you do that, you're pushing an increasingly weak army along on increasingly dwindling resources. So the real question is, how far do you want to push your luck? If you push it pretty hard and do well, you're gonna finish earlier and get more victory points. But you can also completely mess up your army and accidentally kill Alexander, depending on what you decide to do. Once you've gone through that turn as many times as you feel you should, you go to resupply. That's where you gain gold. So you gain per area governed, you gain per enemy force destroyed, and then you get to spend gold and glory to do a couple of different interesting things. You can spend them to buy forces, so you can increase your army, but again, be careful about how much you increase it because it makes it more expensive to move potentially because of those scouting rolls. You can place a temple, and temple affects your fate, which means that you get to reroll dice and have better chances of success. Or you can build a city, which as we discussed, will give you victory points. When you earn glory points from Battle for Alexander, you can use those to purchase insights, which are neat little special powers in the game, or more advisors. So if you like Parmenion, but you want to sub somebody else in for their special power, then glory is the way to make it happen. After that, you'll go back to preparation, advance the turn counter, and start over again. There's one other aspect of the game I want to talk about, however, and that is prophecy. So I mentioned that Alexander starts at a pretty low level. He's kind of wimpy at first. But Alexander has the capability of becoming a real powerhouse, especially if you play through all of the scenarios, all the way from Granicus to Gagamela. And Alexander's going to do this by accepting prophecies. So if you're in Macedon or in Ilium, these are two areas where you're able to accept a prophecy. And there are a number of different ones. So you don't actually know what the prophecy is, but once you decide to look, you have to accept it. So each prophecy will basically give you a special challenge that you have a limited number of turns to complete. So if you complete the prophecy, you get to level Alexander up. You flip him over to his next self. There are several different Alexander chits in the game, each kind of leveling him up as time goes by. If you fail a prophecy, in other words, you don't complete it, then Alexander can go down a level or you lose an advisor. And if you can't do either of those things, then you lose the campaign. So when you come into an area with a prophecy, you could choose to shun it, to ignore it, but once you turn it over, you better complete it. And that's a general overview of Field Commander Alexander. You're gonna fight battles, decide whether to raise or govern areas, build cities, build temples, accept prophecies, achieve your destiny, and hopefully do it before the enemy can build up enough to give you a seriously nasty time. So now it's time for some final thoughts. Let's start with the good. Overall, Field Commander Alexander is a really fun playing experience because it offers you so many choices. While very frequently you'll have to fight a battle, a lot of times you have a choice. Do you want to intimidate a stronghold or do you want to fight it out? You'll also have choices to make in every area you visit. Do you want to build cities? Do you want to build temples? Is it worth spending some glory to pick up a new advisor? And are you brave enough to turn over that prophecy and see what might lie on the other side of the token? All of these choices come together to create something that I think is really exciting and that gives me a lot to think about, especially when I'm also thinking about Alexander's actual historical career. I think this game offers a really nice overview of some of the tensions that he would have faced as someone conquering a large amount of territory in a short amount of time. I think the element of the game that really ties all of this together is actually the economic one. You're never going to have enough gold to do all the things that you want to do, and you constantly need money in order to keep your army on the march and marching fast. But you're also going to want to spend gold potentially to build cities, and you'll have to choose between whether you want small amounts of gold over time, 
something that you'll get if you govern areas, versus getting a lot of gold all at once, which is what happens if you raise one. This choice becomes more difficult when you are playing the campaign because you get an obvious benefit for areas that you are governing in terms of your immortality points at the end of the game, but you're also gonna need cash to make it through the campaign. This economic tension also plays out in your scouting rolls, where you have to watch how big your army gets because a low scouting roll for a big army can lead to an enormous expense. I think that's a really brilliant little mechanism, especially when you combine it with the fact that you can do your conquest round multiple times before going back to upkeep in an enemy turn. So it's up to you to decide how far down do you wanna spend, how weak can your army get before you decide it's time to stop and take a break. That push and pull over how to spend your resources and how deeply to spend them at a given time really gives this game a lot of life, and I like it. There are also some other notably nice things about the game. I like that you can either play one of the four little campaign scenarios, so you can have a shorter game, or you can play them all together for a long campaign, potentially over multiple sessions. There's actually a sheet where you can record your progress so if you want to make a big thing out of this game, you can. If you want to make a humble evening out of this game, that's also possible. And there's also a lot of satisfaction if you play the campaign in taking Alexander from an inexperienced young man who's not that powerful in battle to the scariest and most deadly character in the entire game. Getting to lead Alexander through his entire growth as a military commander is really satisfying and it makes the game tell a nice story. Well, if you win. That said, Field Commander Alexander is not a perfect game, and I think it has flaws that detract from the fun choices that the game encourages you to make. So the main issue with the game, in my opinion, is that you are rewarded for taking as little time as possible with a lot of victory points. And if you take your time, you start to lose victory points. Thematically, I actually understand. Military campaigns in the ancient world need to move quickly. It was bad to get bogged down. And that was something that Alexander absolutely did not want when he was marching his giant army far from home. But that incentive to go fast takes away from your ability to enjoy some of the choices that the game offers. Because if you're going for that high score, you're gonna skip the building of the Cities. You're going to skip picking up cool new advisors and trying them out. You might even skip prophecies if you're not playing the campaign, because why? You can just push your luck, get through everything really fast. And for example, the Granicus campaign, it is technically possible to beat the entire thing in two turns before you even hit the part of the turn track where you're scoring victory points. But to do that, you have to blaze through everything, push your luck really hard, and get lucky. So I feel like the structure of the game generally encourages you to rush, which makes a lot of the cool choices in the game less significant because your best scores are probably going to be the scores that you got when you were pushing your luck and playing wild and it worked for you as opposed to games where you really made a lot of tight smart decisions and got to really savor the experience of playing through. The other concern I have about Field Commander Alexander has to do with its linearity. The game is very linear. You essentially move from one point on the map to the other in a set pattern, there's really not going to be a lot of variation in the directions that you should move or the things that you should do. And you're also playing against static enemies. I mean, with the operations turn, they can suddenly pop out a whole bunch of extra enemies or there are enemy orders that can change the field a little bit. But in general, you're going to do the same thing each time you play each section of the campaign. There are options to make the game harder for yourself, but I think that even those, while they add challenge, don't necessarily change the story. So after you play this game a whole bunch of times, there's very little that's going to surprise you. So I do think this is a game that can wear out very quickly, although I will say that the process of learning how to play it, going through each scenario and playing a big campaign is very satisfying while you have it. I also wanna note that the very things that make this game a little bit less replayable also make the game extremely friendly to new wargamers. If you've never played a war game, you wanna move some guys around on a map and you wanna battle it out and see what happens, I think Field Commander Alexander is a wonderful starter war game because the scenarios themselves are pretty bite-sized. All the instructions you need are on the board and the rulebook itself is fairly short and straightforward. So while the game may not be a forever game for me, I love how accessible it is. And I think that if you're looking to break into this genre and you like ancient history and you like Alexander, you're going to have a good time with this game and it's gonna be a safe place for you to start with war games. So while it's not a perfect game, Field Commander Alexander is good fun, it's very user-friendly, and I give it a seven out of 10, a dice tower seal of approval. Happy gaming.